Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate all of the introductions. I don't think I've ever, I, I, I was trying to, to remember if anyone had ever compared me to Albert Einstein before. And the only person I recall having done that was uh, many, many years ago, my mother, but that was only because my hair was going in every direction. So I, I very much appreciate the connection. Uh, let me share my, uh, my screen. Let me also thank Divya Srijit for uh, the invitation and for setting all of this up. It's been very, very nice. Uh, to be back at least in spirit in, in Kerala. Uh, it's too bad that the, the nice thing about these Zoom talks are that there's no travel, there's no jet lag, but what's really missing are all the side conversations, all the chances to really get to know people and, and to see them. And I really regret that, especially in this instance. So let me uh, share my screen and I will uh, start my talk. Uh, so as, as you've heard, I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, what I'm calling the continuing need for useless knowledge. And, and this comes, uh, as was mentioned, from an article by Abraham Flexner in 1939, where he said, I sometimes wonder whether our conception of what is useful may not have become too narrow to become adequate to the roaming and capricious possibilities of the human spirit. And this was in 1939, so quite a long time ago. Uh, and this article uh, was, there we go, uh, in Harper's Magazine, and his contention again was from a practical view, intellectual life on the surface is a useless uh, form of activity. And he says he's going to concern himself with the question of the extent to which the pursuit of this useless enterprise, intellectual life, is going to prove unexpectedly the source from which undreamed of utility is derived. And he starts the article off in a very interesting way. He talks about a conversation that he has uh, with uh, George Eastman. Now, George Eastman was an industrialist who started the Eastman Kodak Company. They made film and camera and, and everything. And Flexner recounts a, a conversation he has with George Eastman. And he says, George, who do you think is the most important scientist in the world? And Eastman, without any hesitation, says, well, that's, it's very clear. That person is Marconi, because Marconi invented radio and the wireless. And uh, clearly, that's the most important scientist that we have. And uh, Flexner says, well, no, you know, you're wrong. <laughs> He's not. And he says, whatever pleasure we derive from radio or however wireless and radio may have added to human life, Marconi's share was practically negligible. He was inevitable. The real credit for everything that has been done in the field of wireless belongs to Professor Clerk Maxwell and Heinrich Hertz. Whoops, because they are the ones that were the people that developed the ideas of the uh, of, of electromagnetic waves. And here is another quote. I don't seem to be able to go backwards in my uh, talk, so I'll try not to hit uh, go forward too many times, but uh, Samuel Cummins, Mark Twain, in a letter to Helen Keller in 1903, said the same idea. He said, it takes a thousand men to invent a telegraph or a steam engine or a phonograph or a photograph uh, or a telephone or any other important thing. And the last man gets the credit and we forget all the others. So acknowledging what really needs to go before we have these applications. And uh, interestingly, uh, I found a, a couple of other examples of this. 
And uh, one of them uh, is going to be very hard to see, as you can see. It's an enormous infographic, but I've put the, uh, uh, the URL for it here on the slide. It's by the Quartzsoft company. And it's, it, you probably cannot see this at all here. Um, uh, but um, if you, uh, I don't know who is drawing on my screen, but I don't, if you could stop, that would be a very good idea, uh, these lines. Anyway, if um, we go to the next thing, but this is, this infographic is, is how did we get the iPhone? What goes into all the parts of the wife, uh, the iPhone, the Wi-Fi, the battery, computing, the touchscreen, internet, uh, the display, uh, camera, all of these things. And this infographic demonstrates all the different pieces of information that were needed to get to this final product. So if we go to the neck, if we go a little bit further down the screen, you see all of these people and all the things that are much too hard to read here. Uh, but if you go uh, online and take a look at this, uh, it's a fascinating thing. One could get lost in just looking at all the science that's needed for this. But if we go down to the very bottom of this, and here we are 500 or so years before the common era, uh, we have the, uh, using zero in a calculation or the use of the abacus or um, the, the first lens uh, and the ideas of optics, all of which had to be present before one could even begin to think about having something as useful and as complicated as, as uh, the application that we know of as a smartphone. Um, and we've also seen this with um, very much so in the last year and a half in the middle of this pandemic. And I like this quote from Anthony Fauci in an editorial he wrote for the journal Science. He said, what is not fully appreciated is that the starting point of the timeline for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines was not the 10th of January, 2020, when the Chinese published the genetic sequence of the virus, rather it began decades earlier out of the spotlight. So all of this is the useless information that's absolutely critical for being able to solve our many societal problems scientifically. And I, just one more time, um, the, uh, I, there's this wonderful video I'd like to play, um, and uh, uh, let me start it. Uh, again, if, if I could, I don't know who it was that uh, drew on the screen. If you could erase that, I don't know if other people see it. I see it. Uh, if you could erase those lines, that would be very much appreciated. But anyway, let me start up uh, this video. It runs for about four minutes. It talks about the same topic. This was a video that was actually uh, produced by postdocs and graduate students at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, um, for a contest by the Federation of American Societies of Experimental Biology to talk about the importance of basic research. It's a sunny day in San Francisco. We set up a table by the water and asked people this question. If it's the year 1960 and you had $10 to give to science, would you spend it on A, developing an affordable treatment for diabetes, or B, figuring out how bacteria protect themselves? The majority of people we surveyed wanted to spend their money on a diabetes treatment, but what really happened 50 years ago? The government decided to spend money on figuring out how bacteria protect themselves against viruses. The National Science Foundation, the NSF, and the National Institutes of Health, NIH, 
are two government agencies that allocate tax dollars to scientists. And they decided to fund groups of researchers who thought that studying how microbes protect themselves was an interesting question. At the time, there was no way of knowing how this basic research could affect human health. They were simply curious about understanding something about bacteria biology. So what did the scientists find? Normally, when a virus enters a bacteria, it adds its own DNA to that of the bacteria. In doing so, the virus takes over the bacteria and uses it to make more viruses. Scientists found that bacteria protect themselves from viruses by selectively cutting the viral DNA. This basic finding led to a scientific revolution. Scientists learned how to cut specific chunks of DNA and they could use this technique to move genes around. They can even move human DNA into bacteria. And because bacteria are very good at making more of themselves, scientists can use them to make large quantities of human proteins from the human gene that they introduced. So why was this technique useful for modern medicine? Well, one breakthrough was the efficient production of human insulin by introducing the human insulin gene into bacteria. This was a very significant advancement in diabetes treatment. Before using bacteria to produce large quantities of human insulin, insulin was expensive, unsafe, and less effective because it was harvested from fetal cows. In fact, the first person to get an injection of cow insulin suffered from a severe allergic reaction. Because of a long line of federally funded basic research, human insulin is now an affordable treatment for diabetes. By asking how bacteria protect themselves, the scientists discovered that bacteria can cut DNA. This discovery was developed into a basic technique used in thousands of labs around the world to create new knowledge and to ask new questions that have led to all kinds of therapies and technologies, including insulin, DNA fingerprinting and biofuels, the human genome, growth hormones, cancer drugs, stroke medication, vaccines, HIV meds, antibiotics, and many, many more. Given enough time and funding, who knows what is to come? Many other health benefits and current discoveries would have been nearly impossible without federal funding for all kinds of basic research. Basic research is an investment in our future. It broadens our understanding of the world we live in, and the potential benefits are limitless. Unfortunately, science funding in the U.S. has plateaued, decreasing purchasing power, and significantly hurting our competitiveness and innovation. You may not know it, but you and your tax dollars are part of the discovery process. Thanks to you, scientists discovered that bacteria can cut DNA. And thanks to you, insulin, other drugs and diagnostic tools have been developed and are helping patients. So thank you for supporting basic research. We are the scientists who depend on you. And we are excited for the future that lies ahead. Wonderful. I'm going to try something for just a moment to see if I can remove these lines from my screen that it may, may help things. So uh, hold on one second while I try something here. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay, uh, nope, still there. I don't know how to do this then. All right, well, let me just give it. So the question is, how do we make the discoveries? And I was intrigued uh, several years ago to find out that the Nobel laureate Enrico Fermi actually had a very interesting comment about this. What he said was, if you do an experiment and the results confirm your hypothesis, then you've made a measurement. But if the results are contrary to the hypothesis, then you've made a discovery. And I think this is a very true statement. We often talk about the scientific method of coming up with a hypothesis and doing an experiment to confirm the hypothesis. But in fact, I think that's backwards. I think what happens is we do experiments for very good reasons and we get something that doesn't fit with what we know. And then we make the hypothesis from the discovery. So that it's not that the discovery comes after the hypothesis, the discovery actually comes before the hypothesis. And so I think that uh, for this reason, I think we have to uh, 
really wonder about the world around us. I'll have some more to say about this a little later in the, in the talk. And I think we have to be asking a lot of questions. And uh, we never know when these discoveries are going to come. So in order to make those discoveries, we have to do a lot of experiments. I think that's the, the only way to, to sort of have these unexpected things come. And to give you a couple of uh, rather famous examples of this, uh, one of my favorites is the Nobel Prize in 1978 by Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias, who discovered the background radiation in the cosmos, the evidence for the Big Bang, uh, not because they were doing any experiment, but because they were calibrating a 30 foot long microwave uh, telescope that they were using at Bell Labs. And they pointed the telescope at the Milky Way and they got a very strong microwave signal. They were very happy. It was a very sensitive uh, machine and they got a great signal. And then they said, okay, now we have to, uh, to zero this out. Let's point it away from the Milky Way and we should get zero. And of course they pointed it away and they never could get zero. So they couldn't even start their experiment because the machine wouldn't tell them that where they expected nothing, there was nothing. In fact, there was something and that was the discovery of the background radiation. Another example uh, from the Nobel prizes is John O'Keefe who wrote in his Nobel prize winning speech in uh, 2014, um, he co-won this with the Mosher's who uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, in the late 1960s, I had been recording in the thalamus and on one occasion had inadvertently positioned the electrode more laterally in the hippocampus and found a really interesting cell. In other words, he stuck the electrode in the wrong place and he found something far more interesting than what he was studying and had the forethought to say, I better look at this. This is something that might be important. And so these sort of accidents, they're not really the important thing. The accidents happen. If you do enough experiments. It's being fortunate enough to realize there might be something here that I should be looking at. And having, I think, as these people showed, the courage to pursue that. My favorite uh, example of an accident in uh, <laughs> that led to a Nobel Prize, of course, is the work by Osamu Shimomura, who I shared the prize with, uh, with him and Roger Chen in 2008. Osamu was... Os was the discoverer of green fluorescent protein. And his discovery of it is really a series of wonderful accidental discoveries. He was a very, very good biochemist. And he set himself a fascinating problem, which was how is it that for his whole life, how is it that different organisms can generate life? What's the chemistry, biochemistry behind light production? And in the early 1960s, he was in the United States working on this jellyfish, Aquaria victoria, which has this beautiful green um, light that it produces. And by this time, people had already figured out the biochemistry of fireflies. Shimamura, uh, working in Japan originally, had helped in the understanding how a crustacean, Cypridina, produced light. And by this time, they already knew that these very different organisms generated life, a light in very, very different ways. And so there were, there were no precedents. And so he's a very good biochemist. He works really hard grinding up jellyfish, trying to figure out what are, what are the components that generate light. And he fails time after time after time. One night late in the summer, he has failed again in his experiments. He decides to clean up and go home and have dinner. He takes the preparation that has failed and he throws it into the sink that had some various things, but included in the sink some seawater. 
He turns off the light and is about to leave the laboratory when he looks back at the sink and to his great surprise sees the sink is glowing brightly. He goes back and he looks at that and he thinks about this and realizes that there must have been something in the seawater that has allowed the production of light. He thinks about that for a while and realizes that seawater has calcium ions in it and that he had never tried adding calcium ions to his prep. And so over the next couple of days, he redoes the prep and uh, every time he squirts in a solution of calcium ions, he gets a flash of light. And he uses this to purify the protein that is generating light, which he names after the jellyfish. He calls it a quorn. And he finds that a quorn plus calcium will produce light. So that's his first accidental discovery. Uh, I don't think many biochemistry professors, teachers will say this as a general method that uh, one way of getting your experiments sometimes to work is to throw the prep on the floor or the desk or the sink, but in this case it worked. And I've heard of other examples of this as well. In any case, once he made this wonderful discovery, he had a fundamental problem because the jellyfish produces a green light, but this reaction produced a blue light. And he thought about that for a while. He added calcium to all the other samples from his prep, nothing produced light. And he thought there must be something that converts the blue light to green. And so he took a handheld ultraviolet lamp and he used it to excite the various samples. And he found a completely different sample that didn't need calcium at all, didn't need a quorum at all. But if you put in blue light, it gave out green light. And in his 1962 paper, which describes the purification of a quorum, he has a footnote. And the footnote says, there's this other protein that if you shine blue light on it, you will get green light. And I'm gonna call that the green protein. But we of course don't call it the green protein anymore. We call it uh, GFP or green fluorescent protein. And GFP in the organism, GFP with a quorum and calcium, the light that gets produced is not blue, it's green. And I heard about this uh, in a seminar. He had done this, made this discovery in 62. I first heard about it in 1989. And I was very excited about this result because what he was saying was there was a protein that if you simply shine, shone blue light on it, you would get green light coming out. And at the time we were looking at where genes were expressed in our uh, worms, Cenorhabditis elegans, which is a transparent animal. And someone has just told me that I can see where something has been made, this wonderful protein, simply by shining blue light on my transparent animals, and I'll be able to see it coming out green. In other words, that this will serve as a lantern. And I got exceptionally excited about this idea. And uh, eventually we were able to show that that's all we needed. GFP could be put into different organisms. And that was work that was done by a graduate student, Giev Skirkin, in collaboration with the person who cloned the cDNA for GFP, Douglas Pressure. And we were able to show that it was first expressed in bacteria, nothing else added. All you had to do is have the protein and then shine blue light on it. And then, of course, we showed that it would work on our worms and allow us to see our particular cells. And so we got very excited about this as a way of using this information, this useless knowledge. Uh, it's been put in many organisms. Here it is, fruit flies and in zebrafish and in mice. 
And this is an example of a mouse per Kinji cell in the brain. You can see that the GFP has gone everywhere in the cell and allowed it to uh, be visualized quite wonderfully. But the wonderful aspect about GFP is the fact that it can be used in living organisms. And as a result, we can watch things happen. Uh, we can watch uh, events as they take place. And so this is, these are two movies by uh, a woman who at, at the time she made the movies was a graduate student in Canada, Rosalind Silverman Cabrilla. And they both use GFP. The film that I'm gonna show you the clip on, on the left is uh, in black and white, uh, and, and it has GFP attached to a protein that's part of the spindle. And uh, she's looking at four rounds of, divi uh, of nuclear division uh, in the early uh, development of the fruit fly embryo. And at this point, there are only nuclei, there's no cell boundaries. And uh, let me start it so that you can see uh, what's happening. You see the spindle forming. This is very much sped up, uh, goes through another round. And I think the remarkable thing that you see here, and frankly, what inspired her name for this movie, which is In Synchrony, is that all of these divisions are taking place together. And that immediately asks a lot of questions. It introduces a lot of questions. What coordinates all of this? Uh, what's the si what are the signals involved here? Of course, we know quite a lot about this. Now, the movie on the right has GFP, but it's attached to a different uh, component. It's not a component of the spindle. It's a small peptide that brings GFP into the nucleus. So when there are nuclei, as you see in this starting image, then the GFP is all localized to the nucleus. Now, this is a falsely colored image. And the convention for false coloring is that if you have a very little of the protein that of the signal, then it's going to be in blue, a little bit more is green, a little bit more is yellow, a little bit more is orange, the most is red. So you use the rainbow as a way of designating the amount that's there. And you can see that there's various amounts in these nuclei. But when I start the movie up, you'll also see that the nuclei break down because cell division is taking place and the GFP is gonna be all over the embryo. The nuclei reform and the GFP is sucked into the nuclei. But here, rather than being synchronous, you see that the, set, the nuclei are breaking down and reforming um, in a, uh, a pattern that goes from the lower right to the upper left hand corner. So something else is happening here. Now, we're not entirely sure exactly what this is. Uh, a friend of mine has suggested that what this really means is that uh, when this slide was put together, a thumb pressed on one part of it a little heavier than the other and damaged it slightly. But a very sensitive way of looking at what is happening within the cells. And this is one of the real advantages of GFP and now other fluorescent proteins is that you can actually watch life, which is a dynamic process. You can actually watch it taking place. Uh, GFP has led to many other discoveries. Some of these have been in fundamental research and to give you my one of my favorite examples, is uh, Cliff Brangwen and uh, Tony Hyman discovered in 2009, the year after the Nobel Prize. They discovered that the cytoplasm actually has components to it, non-membrane uh, bound components that seem to act as if they are oil in water. They're separated from the bulk of the cytoplasm. Uh, these phase separate, so-called phase separated particles, something that no one expected or uh, suspected was present. Uh, and this has turned into an exceptionally important new area in cell biology is looking at these 
phase separated components of cells, not only in the cytoplasm, but also in the nucleus. Uh, so really all over. But in addition to expanding our fundamental knowledge, of course, GSP has been used to address a number of, of questions uh, that are more um, uh, questions keep getting the wrong thing, that are more applied. And one example I'd like to give is looking at how the how HIV, the AIDS virus, gets transferred from one mouse cell to another. Often when we teach about viruses, we say about cells exploding and the virus particles go off to other cells and infect them. But is that really what happens? And so a group of investigators at Mount Sinai uh, University here, uh, uh, Mount Sinai Medical School here in New York, did a very interesting experiment where they put GFP into the virus and infected mouse cells and asked, how is it transferred? So here is a picture of an infected cell with a viral particle and it's attached to another cell. And you'll see what happens as the particle is transferred into the other cell. No explosion, just a transfer. Now this is very important because it starts to ask the question, not how do we soak up all the virus that might be out there? That might be something you'd use an antibody to, but rather how do you prevent the movement of the particle from one cell to the other? Antibodies may also be important in that as, as well, but looking at the actual biology of what's happening to uh, try to understand uh, this process of infection. Now, this is an ex these are both examples of how fundamental research helps applied research, but in reality, they're both actually helping one another and they go back and forth. The discovery of GFP allows for the application of a method to look at cell function and the cell function is used to understand fundamental processes in biology, which have been further applied and goes back and forth. But there's also a third component here, which is the unexpected that comes out of these things. Because as Flexner pointed out, people have some very interesting ideas and no one can never predict all the wonderful things that people can come, up, can come up with. And so there have been some very unusual uses for fluorescent proteins, including uh, a group in Japan who have put uh, various fluorescent proteins um, connected to the making of these proteins with silk fibroin in silk moths and allowed the silk moths to make fluorescent silk which they've made into clothes. I'm not entirely, it's a wonderful demonstration. I'm not so sure uh, if this is a good, if this is a very useful thing or not, because I think you have to help carry around an ultraviolet light so people can see how cool your clothes are. Uh, nonetheless, it's a very interesting idea. There's also a, a group that, uh, put GFP into cells and then put the cells through um, partially silvered mirrors and generated a uh, laser that was driven with, uh, depended on uh, GFP. So single cell biological uh, lasers. Uh, Robert Burledge uh, was the first to use GFP as a marker for the explosive TNT, but uh, the appropriate promoter to drive GFP in E. coli and made bacteria that would glow uh, in the presence of TNT, which he knew leaked from landmines. And he and many others, several others now have been using this as a way of detecting landmines. Uh, and to me, this is a very exciting idea, even though it's still somewhat untested. This is a type of experiment you never want to have a false negative. And people are trying to make sure that that does not happen. But since landmines affect enormous numbers of innocent people and often well after any conflict has left an area, the idea of being able to detect them and uh, eliminate them safely would be quite wonderful. 
And uh, other examples of rather unusual things, the artist Eduardo Koch commissioned a French biotech company to put GFP into uh, his pet rabbit, Alba, or to make him a pet rabbit, uh, Alba, who he brought to his art shows to get people to think about the connection between art and science and art and technology. And uh, to drive this a little bit more, uh, several years ago, the uh, film director, Ang Lee, uh, produced a movie that from the very beginning of the movie, it uses GFP as an explanation for why this guy is green, uh, the movie Hulk. Now, uh, the third person to share the prize with us was Roger Chen. And among other, many other things that Roger was involved in was the making, it was the uh, development of fluorescent proteins with different colors. And this was used to very great effect uh, by Josh Sains and Jeff Lickman in their uh, four color method of labeling uh, nerve cells uh, in, with a whole variety of colors, which they called rainbow, which was quite nice. Now, how do we promote discovery? How do we uh, allow people to uh, make even these accidental discoveries? And uh, Flexner talked about this, and he was actually, one of the many things that he did is he was the person who came up with the idea and was the first director of what was called the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. And this is where he met Einstein and interacted with Einstein. And he talks about the Institute for Advanced Study. He says that it exists as a paradise for scholars who like poets and musicians have run, won the right to do as they please and who have accomplished most when they're enabled to do so. So give them a place to think. Now, there are, in my mind, three rather amazing places uh, over the years that have, I think, done this. Not only the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, but also the Bell Labs and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, where I was uh, privileged to work for a couple of years. Now, the Bell Labs has produced an enormous number of people that have won uh, Nobel Prizes, mainly in physics and some in chemistry. Uh, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology has a similar long list of people, I think these two institutions may very well be the ones that have the most uh, connected with them that, uh, there. Uh, Princeton Institute for Advanced Study does not have a lot of Nobel laureates connected to it, but it does, it has been the home for mathematicians over the years. And the big prize in mathematics is the Fields Medal. And 41 of the 56, uh, mathematicians who have won the field medal have worked at the Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies. So the question is, what do these places do right? Why, how have they helped? Uh, and uh, I think there's a number of different aspects. One of them is colleagues, that they bring people together uh, that are excited about their science and about what they're doing and that, that interaction helps enormously. The other thing is facilities and along with that supplies. One day when I was a postdoc at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, I needed, for an experiment, I needed an ultraviolet lamp to convert a, one chemical into another. It was a chemical that couldn't be purchased, so I had to do the conversion myself. And I went down to the stock room and uh, talked to the manager of the stock room. And I said, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I need an ultraviolet lamp. And he looked at me completely disgusted and said, what wavelength? That's what I mean by supplies. They had everything and if they didn't have it, they couldn't make it. So having the facilities and supplies 
was quite wonderful being able to, to have that. Uh, and this is really uh, part of the overall thing of support. Now, uh, and they give you the freedom to think. There is an inherent problem in all of this. If you have great colleagues, if you have wonderful, facil wonderful facilities, you have every piece of equipment you would ever need to use, you have all this support. It also means you don't have any excuses. And so you really are, the, the burden is completely on your shoulders. And I can tell you, it, you really do feel it. You feel that, oh, I can't let the side down. I have to use this to my advantage and think about this. So it's, it's a little bit scary, but on the other hand, it's very exhilarating, especially interacting with the other uh, people around you. Um, so how do we make discoveries? And, and for this, I want to talk, uh, I want to go back to this idea of, uh, of um, wonder and questions uh, that are, uh, that comes out of this thing. How do we make these accidental discoveries? And I think one of them is, is the idea of asking questions. And I think there are questions all around us. Now, I see that there's about 287 people or so on this call, and I'm not going to do a poll to do this, but I, I'm going to ask a question, and, and, and I want you to think to yourself of whether you know the answer to this. And so uh, these are, let me have three examples of, of things that I consider questions, things that are all around us. So um, the very first thing that I worked on that was the basis of my first scientific paper was uh, a major transparent part of the body. And when I go and give talks in person, I often ask students in the, the class uh, or in, in the, the lecture, how uh, many of them know what the transparent part of the body is. And I can say that it's been my experience anywhere in the world that uh, maybe about 5% of the people in the audience can raise their hand and saying that they know what uh, the transparent part of the body is. So it's again, something that I, I think most people do not have. And then once I've asked them that, I give them a hint. And I said, look, it's, um, I'll give you a hint. It's right in front of your eyes because what I'm talking about is the cornea could be the lens, there's other things as well. But I have never found anyone other than the people I originally went to work with before I went to graduate school who worked on this that were actually asking the very interesting question, how is it that the cornea is a transparent tissue? What makes it transparent? And I think that's a fascinating question. And it is literally something that has been in the front of our faces our entire lives. I know I never asked myself that question, but it was sitting there. To give you, I'm gonna give you two more examples of these things that are all around us. And at least for myself, I had never seen them. Now, I should also tell you that this will ruin your life. If you haven't made this realization yet, you're never going to be able to get this out of your mind. But we can talk about that. So a little bit of a spoiler alert. Um, so the second thing is plant growth and gravity. Now, people have known even before Darwin did some experiments on this, that if you take a plant and grow it, you know, the roots go down, the shoots go up. If you take a plant in a pot and you put it on its side, then the shoot will bend so that it'll still go up, which is called negative geotropism, and the roots will bend to go down, which is positive uh, geotropism. So this is an experiment that has been known for well over 150 years. But what most people have not realized is that's not the only 
response to gravity that plants have. That if we look at various types of plants, if we just take trees, for example, we will see that it's not only the main shoot or the trunk of the tree and the roots that ha have a response to gravity, it's all the branches as well. So that we get some trees like the cypress in which all the branches point up. So everything is pointing up, whereas other trees like a fir tree might be off at a particular angle. This is called the set point angle for these plants. And there are some, as in this case, that are off uh, uh, angle to upright. There are some that are completely parallel to the ground. And there are even some that are mutants that can't uh, do this in any way, like the weeping willow, weeping walnut, and other trees like that, that, that look like they're defective in this. And I can tell you that when you next go outside and look at trees, you are going to notice this set point angle. It's something that's there all the time. But again, it's a problem. It's a question that has, we've, we've seen our entire lives, but probably have never asked about. And my final example uh, has to do with muscle. When I was a graduate student, I was a graduate student in a physiology department. We had to teach physiology to medical students. And the, uh, one of the lectures was on muscle. And when the instructor would talk about muscle, he would say that there were different types of skeletal muscle. One type of skeletal muscle was called fast twitch muscle. It responded very quickly, but didn't work continually. And the reason for that is it went into oxygen debt, but it could respond in, in a, a very quick way. But there, was other, there were other types of skeletal muscle, which were called slow twitch muscles, which were needed for sustained activity. For example, maintaining posture, where the muscles had to work continually for long periods of time. And because of that, they couldn't go into oxygen debt. They needed to have their own oxygen supply. And that oxygen was provided in the muscle by a molecule very much like the hemoglobin in the blood called myoglobin. And this, what, this is what brought oxygen to the muscle for its sustained activity. Now, I can tell you that by this point in the lecture, most of the medical students had fallen asleep and thought, oh, this is, uh, why should I be learning this? And had been sort of ignoring it. And then the instructor added one thing. And I should tell you that these lectures were usually done in late October, early uh, November, in other words, before the students were going to go home in the United States on their Thanksgiving break. But then the instructor said, so the difference between the fast twitch and the slow twitch muscle is the reason there is a difference between the white meat and the dark meat in the chicken or the turkey. So it was all a lecture to get them to go home and prove to their parents that they had actually learned something in medical school. But in fact, I've never met anyone who has said, you know, I, I've always wondered what the difference was between the, light, the white meat and the dark meat of a chicken or a turkey, and not realizing that the dark meat in the leg and the thighs is because of the myoglobin and the fact that it's slow twitch muscle that is there to keep the bird erect. Whereas the breast uh, muscle is for flapping wings and it doesn't have to work a lot, especially in chickens. Uh, and so it's uh, uh, the fast twitch type of muscle which has to act quickly. Okay, so these are some ideas about uh, really getting at the, the question of asking questions about really the world around us and a way of trying to help us do that. But I think it's more than asking questions. I think an important aspect uh, to all of this 
is questioning assumptions. And uh, recently I've gotten excited about this from the point of view of, of, of these puzzles that I remember when I was a kid, which were made from toothpicks or matchsticks, which are sort of puzzles that you were supposed to think out through. But I think they're good examples of having us question our assumptions about uh, experiments. So for example, it'll, uh, we'll have a, a question like this, get rid of three matches. Uh, to get a, a perfect square, to, to get three perfect squares. And after some playing around, you realize that you can remove uh, these three matches here, put them over here, and then you wind up with three things. And that takes a little while, but you eventually get to that. Or maybe the, another famous problem is one of move three matches and turn the fish around. And one can play with this and realize that eventually you move these three matches here, you move them up here, and now the fish is going in the other direction. It takes maybe a little bit more thought to play around with that, but eventually you get to that. And then every once in a while, there's a tricky question. Uh, one of the ones that I found online is, is this question here. Make these three matches into six, which seems absolutely impossible until you realize that the three matches are the Roman numeral three. And so if you just move them around a little bit, you can get the Roman numeral six. And now you've solved that, that problem. So these are all tricky. But there's a very famous one of these problems that I think really gets at the question of our assumptions, what we're doing. So after having done all of these problems, you may turn and say, okay, now what, what, uh, what happens here? Use six matchsticks to make four equilateral triangles. And you know, three of them make an equilateral triangle, how can you use six to make four? And this stumps a lot of people. I think the first time I ever saw this, I was completely stumped with this. But I think this gets at the idea of assumptions because the one of the answers is to make this tetrahedron. And you suddenly realize that not only can you make for equilateral triangles this way, but that you've always assumed that you had to be working in two dimensions. And why think only in two dimensions? That's the assumption that we have accepted from this. And in looking through this, I actually found online another solution, which I think also points out another question, another assumption that I think we bring to these problems. And that's uh, this solution in which this, now this is actually in sort of two dimensions or uh, on at least the surface. And what you can see is there's one, two, three, and four. And here the assumption is why did all the triangles have to be the same size? So I think a lot of what we hold ourselves back from is that we don't question what our assumptions are. And to bring this to a little more scientific area, uh, I have a, a good friend who is a colleague here at Columbia with me for many years. It's at, and, and then left named Mu Ming Pu. Mu Ming Pu is one of the world's great neurobiologists. And he has what he calls the retrospective approach to science. Because one day we were standing around and we were talking and, and he had just had a whole series of spectacular papers and discoveries. And somebody asked Mu Ming, how do you come up with all of these ideas? Where do you get these ideas? And this is what he described as his retrospective approach. He said, but the first thing he did is he had a textbook, uh, an interest, and he looked up 
uh, an interesting hypothesis in the textbook. And for him, it was the second edition of the textbook for molecular biology of the cell. And so he was just reading this. And then once he found something that was an interesting idea, he then said, well, why do we believe this? What is the basis of this hypothesis? And he'd go back and he'd read the original literature and look at this and think about it and usually find that the, it was based on an experiment from quite a number of years before and there were more modern techniques that could be applied to the problem and he could revisit the problem that other people had assumed was established fact. And so he would test it using more modern methods and then usually find something out that either invalidated the original conclusion or changed it significantly and you'd have another spectacular paper. And he built a, a rather amazing uh, career on just asking, why do we believe the things that we do? And I actually had a little bit of an experience of this myself when I was starting to work on worms. The cell that I work on, or the cells that I work on, are uh, neurons that are, have very distinctive microtubules in them. And uh, one day I was asked, or one day I, at the beginning of my postdoc, I announced to everyone in the room, I am going down to look at all the electron micrographs of the cells I'm studying. But when I got to the room to look at the pictures, and these show some of the pictures here, I realized that I had no idea what I should be looking at. And, but I looked at the pictures and I was too embarrassed to go right back up to my lab. Uh, and so I tried to think of what could I do? And I decided that the one skill I had here was I could count. And so I counted the number of microtubules in the cell. And here, there's many fewer in this cell here, A, here's it. And then I graphed out all the numbers for the A cell and the B cell. And I got this mountain range. And I looked at that and I didn't, and I thought, okay, I've done enough work and go back. And I happened to meet a friend and he said, where, where have you been? And I said, I've been looking at my cell. And he said, what did you find? And I said, well, and I showed him my graph. And he asked a very important question, which is in keeping with all of this. He said, is that what was, is that what's supposed to happen? And I said, I'm not sure I'm going to find out. And I found out that this was not what was supposed to happen. Everyone believed that microtubules, microtubules run the entire length of a cell. They start off in the cell body and they go to the end. In fact, I found a paper that said, microtubules probably go the full length of nerve cells. And that means that they can be meters long, maybe even 10 meters long in the nerve cells in whales. Well, if microtubules go the entire length of the cell, then if you're close to the cell body, you should have a lot of them. And then you might lose some along the way, but it should just slope down. What you should not have is something going up and then down and then up and down and up and down and up and down. That doesn't make any sense with this hypothesis. So I asked, what, why did people believe in this? What was their, their reasoning? And the reasoning was that uh, at the time they could not do serial section reconstruction of nerve cells, but they could do some electron microscopy. And uh, they took a nerve cell that was known to branch. And they asked, what happens if we look at the number of microtubules, if we cut near A, just the unbranched part of the nerve cell. And how does that compare to the number of microtubules in the branches? And what they found 
was that um, the number of microtubules in the initial segment, A, was approximately equal to the sum of the microtubules in the other two parts. And so and there was some error there. They, in fact, there was at most 10% error, but they, they just said, okay, this is evidence that in fact, microtubules are continuous because it looks like the same number is there both before and after the branch. But when we looked at, at our numbers here in this graph, we knew that that couldn't be the case. And then we actually were able to use the more modern method of doing serial sections to look at every single section uh, uh, from part of a nerve cell. And what we found there was in fact that the microtubules, each diagram here is a line, uh, actually started and stopped within the segment that we looked at. And we were able to calculate that the microtubules were about 1 20th the size of the nerve cells. They did not go the entire length. And subsequent researchers found that this was true not only for nematodes, but for rabbit nerve cells and others. And so, uh, this idea based on what I would say was the best evidence at the time was not, was not actually true. So I think in all of this, we have to be asking questions about what's around us. We have to be questioning the assumptions and going back repeatedly and asking, why do we believe the things that we believe? And can we address those questions? This. And I think, as I pointed out several times in this talk, that it's exceptionally important to support the useless basic information, baseless knowledge that's going to enable us to make more discoveries in the future. And I want to leave you with my favorite quote about basic research, which came in 1969 by Robert Wilson, who was a physicist who uh, was asked to talk to the US Congress about uh, the funding of what was going to be a new particle accelerator. And it was actually built on the Fermi lab and has been a place of stupendous discovery. But in 1969, in the middle of what was called the war in Vietnam or the Vietnam War in the United States, the country and the Congress people were very much concerned about national security and national, uh, and national defense. And they were uh, a little bit skeptical about the importance of a basic science project. And so John Pastore, the Senator from Rhode Island asked Wilson, what he thought were how many ways was this particle accelerator going to have help national security? And Wilson said none, which was not the answer the senator wanted because the senator was quite uh, positive about the project. He wanted to convince his colleagues. So he asked them the question a couple more times and each time Wilson said no. And finally, Pastore, I think somewhat frustrated, said, Dr. Wilson, in what respect will this particle accelerator help the national defense? At which point Wilson said the following. He said, it has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with whether we are good painters, good sculptors, great poets. I mean all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending the country, except to make it worth defending. Thank you very much. You know, I, I, there are always obstacles. There's always frustration um, in a general way. Um, so there's a story I like to tell. This may not be exactly what you are thinking about, but um, I often get a question, I often get a 
question about how do you deal with failure uh, in, in things? Because that's, that's, I think, the biggest problem in doing research is something doesn't work out. You become so in love with your own idea and your own idea doesn't work. And uh, the story I like to tell is, uh, happened uh, many years ago, 2004. Uh, my daughter at the time was 12 and I was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. And I went for the induction ceremony and my wife and daughter came with me. And uh, if, if you ever have problems sleeping, see if you can get a video of the induction ceremony into the National Academy of Science, because it's a group of 70, now it's actually more than 100 people, and they get up one at a time, they stand on the stage, they have a picture taken on the stage, they shake hands with the uh, president of the academy, they walk across the stage and sign a book. Not a very dramatic thing to watch, uh, but while they're walking, someone reads one sentence about them. Now you have to imagine, this is a room where all the friends and relatives of these people are there and they're only interested in one person, the person that's walking across the stage that they know. Everyone else, it's just background noise. And I thought to myself, my daughter must be just bored out of her mind. So I, when I finally made my way back down to my wife and daughter, I said to my daughter, you know, I was really happy she was there to help me celebrate being elected to the National Academy, but I wanted to apologize because I thought she would be bored. And this 12-year-old looked at me, I must admit, if she looks at me many times, like I was the stupidest person in the universe, and said, Dad, don't you understand about these people? So I was game. What, what did she mean? What, what did she notice? Because she was listening to all those sentences. She said, Dad, every one of those people was the very first person in the world to do or see what they did. They were the first. I'm exceptionally proud of that answer because that's the answer of why there's failure in science and also the great reward about this. And it's not Nobel Prize winning discoveries or anything, but we make discoveries all the time. And we are indeed the first people in the world to do that. So if we're constantly discovering new things, it's not gonna work all the time. It's going, there's going to be a lot of failure. Now, a quick answer to what I think was more of your question is, resources. I talk about the wonderful Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies or the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology or the Bell Labs and having all these wonderful facilities. And I would wish that on many places and I hope that in many countries people can uh, decide, governments can decide that this is the important thing to support, but I know that that's not the case and that funding is a, uh, a limit. And I don't know how to go about that. Um, I think that many times people feel I have to do something applied because I'm going to chase the money. I would say if you feel that, and you feel you must do that in order to get some money, that I, I'm not going to say that's a bad idea. Some wonderful applied things have done, but use some of it to do something else, <laughs> to use it to think about the, the other, other opportunities. And I think part of the answer is that we all have to advocate in our own government uh, and, and not be silent, that we have to talk up the importance of research uh, and, and what it means uh, to our countries and to uh, our health uh, to be able to have this. So I think 
we are somewhat obligated in um, making a point. In that video that I showed, there's a line that says, research funding has stabilized or has not grown in the United States. Well, that was until about five or six years ago. So just as that, that a couple of years after that video, after that, there actually has been an increase because I, I think in the United States and I think in several other countries, people have realized the competitive advantage of being able to support research. But I think it's also taken scientists to convince their governments about all the uh, benefits that come from the research environment. And I'll sort of let it go with that and see if we can have other questions. Yeah, I'll try to answer short, more short. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Martin. And another question is, uh, you know, a, a general question. Uh, often uh, the the the, uh, the uh, funders uh, uh, often support the cutting edge research in biotechnology, not the basic sciences. And how do you uh, how do we actually overcome this issue, Shweta? So. Uh, part of it is education. And I think right now we, we are in a wonderful situation right now. <laughs> if there's any wonderful aspect to this pandemic of looking at what the science has done to help people and how it was not, as I, that quote from Anthony Fauci, it was not just the making of the vaccines but all the, the various things that science had the background for to be able to look at, at things to help science. I know um, here at Columbia, we've had a series of uh, symposia every week starting last a year ago, March. And people have, it, there's been people from the engineering department that said, well, we know that there's not enough face masks. So we redesigned face masks or another person saying when people were worried about virus on surfaces, what's the best way of disinfecting a surface? And the end, uh, we have an engineer here uh, who is a, an authority on foams. And he was able to show that a foam disinfectant was so much more effective than a spray disinfectant for getting surfaces. Another science, set of scientists have been working on the idea that normally we disinfect with long range ultraviolet light. And long range ultraviolet or long wavelength ultraviolet light definitely disinfects, but it also is damaging to biological organisms. Short wavelength ultraviolet light doesn't get through the dead area, the dead layer of skin, or even past the tear layer in the eye. And so it looks like it's entirely safe for people or other, bi other organisms, but kills the virus. And so the idea of using short wavelength to be able to disinfect public areas was something that was being studied. People studied the biology, the epidemiology, the uh, symptoms. Uh, there was a, one group that realized that the one major problem in hospitals was no one know, knew which beds were empty to be able to put the patients that were coming in. Uh, we've seen people studying the mental health aspects of this. We're seeing people looking at the economic aspects. Uh, we're looking at all sorts of other sequelae of it. And it's been the scientists that have been able to study these things and to make suggestions in the health. And without the science, we would be in a much, much worse situation. So um, I think we have something that we can go to administrators and say, look, this is what has, was important for this enterprise and what we have to maintain for the future. And we'll never know what we need. We have to have a very broad base uh, research effort. Question from uh, uh, Professor Balamurugan, uh, Professor Alagapa University said, how far uh, C. elegans uh, helped with, the, with your GFP studies? as an experimental animal. 
So the interesting thing, so I, I, I had started working as a postdoc in 1977 on C. elegans. And I was interested mainly in uh, how uh, I, I was studying a set of cells that were the nerve cells that sense touch. And I was finding mutants that were defective in touch. And these mutants allowed us to study two very broad areas of biology. Some of the mutants did not respond to touch because they never made the cells. So this allowed us to study problems of cell differentiation and development. Don't make the cells, you can't sense anything. And so they led us into studies of development. But others of the mutants were mutants that uh, were, the cells were made, they just didn't work. And when we started the work, no one had any idea about what molecules were needed to sense mechanical signals. People have known for well over 130 years that the molecule rhodopsin in our retinas is what allows us to see. And people for the last 40 or so years have identified cell receptors that allow us to detect chemicals, whether internally neurotransmitters or hormones or externally odors or tastes. So we know about chemical signaling, but we have a lot of senses that are mechanically driven. Our sense of touch, which actually is five different types of cells in our skin, our sense of hearing, balance, stretch of our muscles, detection of blood pressure. There's a whole series of mechanically driven senses. And when we started the work, no one had a clue about the molecules that were important for that. And so while we could study development with some of our mutants, we could hope to get at the molecular basis of mechanosensation with the other set of mutants. In 1989, when I first heard about GFP, uh, we were in the midst of cloning all of our genes. So I go to the seminar that I first hear about GFP and there's two things in my mind. One is for the previous 12 years, whenever I gave a talk, I would say, I work on a transparent animal because that's what C. elegans is. It's completely transparent. And then I heard about a transparent animal for 12 years, wanting to know about gene expression and doing experiments that gave us that answer. But realizing this was a way of being able to look at gene expression in a living animal and all the things that, that would be entailed about it. So I think it was that, so C. elegans was critical in this. If I was working on any other thing, I believe I would have just said, oh, interesting information. Uh, I, I'm not thinking about it, but it just happened to be I heard that seminar at the right time in my life when I was thinking about gene expression and I worked on a transparent animal. So it wasn't some really brilliant insight. I think it was just this coming together of uh, a number of, of wonderful things all at, at the same time. And it, it, I was very fortunate. Thank you, uh, Professor. And then another question by uh, Sumi is that, can we change the emission characteristics of GFP by modulating or turning the composition of amino acids? And the answer is that has been done. You can both change the excitation uh, um, uh, maximum and the emission maximum. And uh, the, one of the first people to change uh, the uh, emission and so make a different color was Roger Chen who changed an important tyrosine that's in the uh, really important uh, sort of uh, fluorophore, chromophore uh, region of the molecule and changing that to a histidine and making a blue fluorescent protein. And in fact, uh, all of those colors that uh, I showed in one of the slides that he made, those are the results of either taking GFP 
and modifying it to make it blue or a yellow green, which is about the extent that GFP can be changed. And then um, some Russian scientists discovered that coral made a very similar protein, which was called DS red. Uh, it was a red fluorescent protein. And DS red can be modified by many, many changes, over 20 amino acids after you change. But that's what Roger used to make all the other colors. And so they uh, were able to modify them. So the answer is absolutely. Uh, so it's a combination of modifying the sequence and also going out and finding other fluorescent proteins. And in fact, one of the remarkable things to me about what's happened with uh, after GFP became a tool is that people went out and said, what other fluorescent organisms are there? What other molecules are out there in nature that we have been ignoring that might turn out to be very uh, useful or informative? And so there's been over the, the decades since we introduced GFP, uh, the uh, discovery of these really remarkable molecules uh, that uh, people have discovered, I think, motivated by, by GFP. And another question is a general question by Annie Deepti. And this is that next year has been declared as the International Year of Basic Sciences uh, for Sustainable Development by UN. And in this context, what advice you will give to the developing country like India? So one of the things, several years ago, I was privileged to go to Brazil. And um, it happened to be they have a week, a science week, whole country is science week. And I got a chance to see something that they did that I thought was really quite wonderful. They had a science project for the entire, all the school children in the entire country. And this project was a very simple project. What it was, was they sent vials of pH indicator to all the schools in Brazil. And they showed the students and the teachers how to measure the pH. And they said, go to your local water supply and measure the pH. And then here's, uh, you, you, you send us back the information, usually by computer, uh, and they mapped out the acidity of the entire water supply in Brazil by having students be part of this really large project that they were all part of, that they all contributed to the sort of group sourcing sort of experiments. And I think those sort of experiments are wonderful ideas to be able to make, to show people they can participate in, they can be involved in this. You don't need a PhD to be part of this scientific enterprise. There are all sorts of, um, of efforts I know that people have done uh, among like birding communities to be able to document organisms, how many birds of one type or another in one area. And it's the crowdsourcing a component of this that's important. And it shows people that they can be part of it and also what the importance of the experiments are. So my suggestion would be that involving students in these sort of group scientific efforts, I think would be a wonderful way to celebrate basic science and, and activities. I just have two quick questions. Uh, so I am a second year PhD student right now at Aisa Thiruvananthapuram. And uh, I would just like to ask you two questions. One, um, what do you feel is the importance of like uh, a young researcher's approach towards scientific communication and why and how that plays an important role in how you were able to uh, make your science available to people at large? And um, of course, in your experience, both as a former PhD student and as a guide 
and uh, guiding so many students. How do you keep science fun and interesting, even through large tracks of time of monotony as well as uh, you know pressure, which sometimes comes as part of the academia? So, uh, two quick answers then to these questions. The first is. Um, uh, Right now, maybe I have this, maybe I'm gonna answer both questions in, in this way. Right now, I have a very small lab and uh, through various problems with people, uh, you know, one, not problems, one person, uh, his, his wife had a baby, so he's out of the lab for a while. Another person had to have an operation. And so the, the lab has become very small. And at the moment, it is four, undergraduates primarily four undergraduates and me so they're they're just starting and i have had a great deal of fun working with them and part of it is because they come up with really interesting ideas because they haven't seen the material before and it's that new set of eyes taking a look at stuff and asking questions that i you know, I talk about assumptions. It's wonderful to see them breaking with whatever preconceived knowledge there is because they don't know it. And they're asking really interesting questions. So I think uh, in general, uh, I feel that uh, we have this wonderful opportunity uh, in the lab. I've, I've always felt this, that everyone is equal. There may be some people that have more skills, but uh, it really is that we are all collaborating with one another and so that everybody contributes, whether it's the newest person in the lab or the person who's been there for decades like myself, uh, we're all part of the team. And, and I think that's, uh, that's a good thing. Um, how do I keep it fun? Uh, I have to say that I feel that my greatest um, uh, positive point, my, the, the greatest thing that I add to the science in my lab is the fact that I'm enthusiastic. I get excited about just about everything. Uh, you could see, see that in the talk, but those matchstick things, once I had the idea that I was going to put those matchstick puzzles in the thing, I spent about two or three days wasting time wonderfully <laughs> looking at all the matchstick puzzles I could find online. Um, I in, enjoy... Um, I, I enjoy getting enthusiastic. And if I get enthusiastic about things, I think other people get enthusiastic. So it's not, um, it's not a false enthusiasm. I am genuinely excited about these things. And I think that's one of my better, better attributes is that I can still get excited when there's a way of solving a problem. And just recently, uh, we had a... Uh, a meeting of all the people that work on CLNs. It was a virtual meeting. And I happened to see a poster uh, that uh, a, a technician from a lab at Stanford had. And it had a wonderful technique uh, for part of what we needed. And then I realized we could actually change it so that it would work for everything that we needed. And it just opened up a lot of new possibilities. And I, I don't yeah, think anyone's been able to stop me from talking about it. I just, I've gotten really excited. Um, in terms of fun, um, I think sometimes you have to come up with things that are a little bit different. Um, I teach a course this lab, uh, on uh, a second sort of stage course uh, for uh, first year graduate students and for beginning, uh, for graduating seniors that's the sort of second tier genetics course. And it's a three hour seminar. And uh, I realized that a three hour seminar is really exhausting for everybody and that we needed to take breaks. And I decided for the course that um, 
before each break, which we had every hour, I would assign a student in the class a project. And the project was they had to tell the group a joke. And so three, a couple of times in a three hour lecture, one or another of the students would tell a joke to the other and it really loosened everything up. So um, I think I'm gonna continue that when I continue my teaching. Hello, sir. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, do you think in this day and age that it is possible to make discoveries in science with limited facilities? So the answer is, I don't think it's the facilities that, that do it. There are people that are always going to do big, expensive science, and that's going to be uh, an, an issue. But I think that the discoveries, that, I think there are so many discoveries that are still out there that we are able to do, and I don't think it they necessarily uh, require uh, all sorts of fancy equipment. I think what's more important are the questions. Let me give you a, a, a sort of a, a, an example of something that I, I saw that I thought was a very interesting. Every, almost every year for the last 10 years or so, I've gone to uh, something called the ISIF, the International Science and Engineering Fair. This is a, a high school science fair that has people from all over the world competing. It's sort of the end of the year science fair. They've won their local science fairs, their uh, country's science fairs, and now they come to, to this meeting. And there's usually a, uh, a panel, and I've been on the panel. And uh, I have to say these high school students get me exceptionally excited about what they've done. Now, some of them have gone off to local universities, but others have really been thinking uh, about things that are maybe a little bit different from everything else, but yet have come with wonderful experiments. And the one I'm thinking about right now is I was walking along uh, where all the displays were and there was a student there and I stopped at her uh, display, which looked a little unusual to me. And she explained to me that she was a ballet dancer. And that as a ballet, and apparently almost a professional quality ballet dancer. And she said, you know, ballet shoes are really expensive and they only last one performance. And then you have to buy a whole new pair of shoes. And that can be very expensive if you're at this very high uh, level. And she said, and I wondered about that because the problem is it's the sole of the ballet shoe that is the problem. It's made out of cardboard. And after an hour of performing, it no longer has the shape it's supposed to have. And so her experiment was to get some carbon composite material and see if she could make a new sole for her ballet shoes. And she found a way of making, taking some material and making a sole in the ballet shoe that would last not a performance, but would last for months. And I thought to myself, what a wonderful project. She saw a problem that no one else probably had ever seen. And then she used her scientific uh, knowledge and ideas to come up with an idea of how to solve that problem. And while you know, she had to go look into how to get some equipment, it, it, it did not require a vast lab to do this. So I think part of the answer is we, as I was trying to say in the talk, I think we all need to look around. Would I like there to be more fa uh, facilities and resources for people all over the world? Absolutely. 
but I don't think it's only the resources that allow us to do good science. So considering the fact that uh, we, today we methodically categorize knowledge into useful and useless, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I have got, I've got this query that are we too ignorant to categorize knowledge into, uh, to methodically categorize uh, or group knowledge into two categories? And are we comfortably ignoring the fact that uh, there, is, there is much that is uh, to be explored and we are not really going about exploring the unexplored realm? So the, I think that Flexner's use and my use of the term useless uh, for useless knowledge is, is really uh, somewhat sarcastic. Is He's saying it's not useless knowledge. It's the usefulness of useless knowledge. It's what people are saying is useless, is that we really have to look much more broadly at everything. So uh, if, if Part of your question is, uh, have we been able to characterize things into these categories? The answer is obviously no. We have much more to learn. Um, to take one example, we, you know, one of the great accomplishments of the early uh, part of the century was the sequencing of the human genome and genome, but still we are basically ignorant about what most of the human genes encode, what they do, uh, how they work together. There's so much more to learn, uh, even just in that realm, uh, that we have much, much more to learn. And I think, I, I think Flexner's point, and certainly my point is, that trying to categorize something as useless is a fool's errand. It's not really uh, uh, appropriate. It's not really correct that there is a lot of stuff and it's really up to our minds to come up with what uh, to, to give meaning and to uh, thought behind these things. Have you time to uh, time for a few more questions? Uh, for sure. No yeah, problem. then Venkata, Venkata. Yes, sir. So I have a one small quick question. Uh, from a retrospective of your ideology, so based on any uh, revolutionary change, what do you suggest that in the future biomedical science, uh, will there be any big impact of using this GFP application in the biomedical field? What do you suggest? Will the, so is the question, will there be a use of GFP in biomedical science? Yes, sir. And will be that cause any very big revolutionary changes in the biomedical field? So I think there already has been. As I tried to point out, I think that we've been able to look at uh, many more biological events, biomedical events, in terms of, of this. People have looked at how cancer metastasizes by looking in mice. People have used GFP, although I don't know the exact uh, answers, but when people, uh, there have been studies that have asked the question, can we direct a virus to a cancer? Now, if that were the case, that would be a wonderful uh, way of treating cancer if you could actually have something that went selectively to cancer cells, because then they could deliver something to kill the cancer cells. And I know a number of people are studying this sort of process, but how do you know if something is going to a cancer cell? The easiest way is in, in the, the establishment, put GFP in the virus. See if viral infection leads to just the cancer cell being labeled with GFP or if other cells are labeled. If it really is selective to the cancer, you have a way of indicating it. And I know that people have actually tried uh, studies like this uh, in uh, very preliminary clinical trials. I've never heard the results of those uh, trials, but I, I know that there have been people that have, have tried that. I think that there's lots of questions that people can ask by looking at changes over time. But we're not going to be putting GFP for the most part, into people as some sort of treatment. 
th there's um, one of the uh, things that Roger Chen was working on just before he died uh, was uh, to try to have a molecule, not a virus, but a molecule that would selectively go to cancer cells and label them. Why would he want that? Well, he wanted it because he realized that one of the problems in surgery was that the surgeon goes in to remove a tumor and will only remove what she sees. So it has to be a fairly large tumor. But if there was a molecule that went to cancer cells and made them fluorescent, then you could see where the small patches of tumor material was and those could be removed. Even Thank you. better, yeah. even better, you would save the nerve cells and other cells that were not uh, in danger of having cancer around them. Instead of going and taking a large cut of things, one could be selective in this. And so he was using that, but that didn't require GFP, that just required another fluorescent molecule. So I don't think we're going to see GFP in people as, as, a, as a thing, but we're going to see fluorescence. No, 